Welcome to The Shooting Show. This week, Byron's on safari in South Africa, hunting mountain reedbuck, kudu, feral goat. And during the dark hours, he's out lamping for jackal. We return to Africa with Byron Pace and his stint at Winterberg Safaris is coming to an end. Before he leaves though, he's desperate to take a kudu. Byron and Deerfan head out and it doesn't take long to spot movement on the hills, but engineering themselves into a shooting position looks set to prove tricky. I came so close to bagging the most magnificent kudu bull. The way the terrain was, we just couldn't close the distance. And with 350 yards plus, as well as a rifle that wasn't my own and a stiff breeze blowing up the valley, I just wasn't comfortable taking the shot. So it was better for me to leave it, see if we could catch up with it another day. All was not lost though, just as we were leaving, in the final minutes of daylight, we spotted a mountain rebuck with one horn. We managed to get in position, get a shot off. I was a bit concerned when I pulled the trigger because there was very little reaction from the antelope. But I knew the shot was good, so after a bit of searching, we eventually found it. It had run on maybe 30, 40 yards. So I'm very happy to have something hanging up in the larder on the first day. Hopefully tomorrow will bring even better things. Yeah, and we started the night trying to find kudu, we found some, but couldn't get a shot off. Uh, on our way out, we came across this mountain rebuck, but it wasn't uh, quite straightforward. Just talk me through me taking the shot. Well, on our way back, I thought it was actually too late to hunt, and we got this luck of this little rebuck standing there. As we got ready to shoot, it went behind the bush. And waiting for it to clear on the other side, it actually turned around and came back. As Byron shot it, it looked like it was a complete miss and we didn't even hear anything. And afterwards, when we started making sure if we did eat it, we actually found this rebuck mm. lying about 30 meters from where we shot it. You've got, to be, you've got to be careful and you've always got to check is the moral of that story. Definitely. That is... The most important thing, once you fire the shot, go and make sure because it's so easy to make a mistake. Make sure if there's any blood, if, if the, check the tracks, all of that. And if you're 100% confident that there's no blood, then you can give it up. And just finally, this is quite a good uh, little ram to shoot. And what's the reason for that? The reason for that, that is like a, I would say, more of a cull ram because it's one horn is broken off. Mm -hmm. And they, but they can do a lot of damage, can't they? Most definitely. When two rams is fighting and the horns can't interlock, most of the time that one horn is actually much more dangerous than two horns. And that ends up hurting the other rams as well. My last day in the Winterberg Mountains was a short one. That afternoon, Deerfan had to take me to the airport so that I could fly north and join an anti-poaching patrol near the Botswana border. I didn't really think that we were going to have a chance to shoot anything 
that morning. But we went out all the same, spied the mountainsides. In particular, we were looking for a nice big kudu bull. We'd been looking the whole week that we'd been there. And although we had seen plenty of kudu and a lot of young kudu bulls, just getting an opportunity at a nice big mature animal and the right animal to shoot was proving very difficult. Now Deerfin had told me about the feral goats that were in this mountain range and I'd seen them the previous year I'd been there. But for the time that we'd been there this year, we hadn't actually spotted them, so this was the first time. And this was an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. There were two very nice billies amongst the group up there. So uh, we set out, headed up the mountain, looking at our watches the whole time because we were very much um, pressing against time. Uh, eventually we managed to get within a reasonable shooting distance. We watched them for a while, they were moving amongst the rocks. We identified that the two animals we wanted to shoot and then it was just a case of waiting for a clear shot. It didn't take long for a shot to present itself, but unfortunately I was trying to organize the camera and my rifle at the same time and soon the billy was completely out of sight again. But the rest of the goats were slightly higher up and I was pretty confident that he was going to work his way behind this rock face and come out and I should be able to get another chance at a shot. So I got ready, this time my rifle was in my shoulder, a minute, maybe two minutes passed and I saw him appear behind some scrubby bushes mm -hmm. and sure enough he paused just long enough for me to get a shot off. I took the crosshair up behind his shoulder, drilled him right through the, the near side shoulder. It was a solid strike. He took a couple of steps up the hill, turned around, came flying off the cliff. Now, unfortunately, we were really up against it with oh, time man. now. So I wasn't able to film the end of this hunt. We were just able to get in there and had enough time to take a quick picture. We had to leave the goat where it was. And after we left that afternoon, um, some of the farm workers went up and dragged it off the hill and actually all the goat meat uh, went to the, the farm workers on the farm that we shot it on. So nothing was wasted, but we were just in a bit of a rush. It had been a fantastic end to what was a great week, and I just can't wait to get back there next year. And just a shame I'm gonna have to wait a full 12 months. Byron doing what he does best there, and now the Shooting Show News. This is the Shooting Show News. The Scottish Government has closed the petition opposing Ergon licensing, just after it reached 22,000 signatures. The petition received its second hearing at Hollywood's Public Petitions Committee, which closed the petition on the grounds that the forthcoming licensing bill would give shooters another chance to make their views known. The petition had grown strong enough to draw a written response from Justice Secretary Kenny McCaskill, but the Government is still determined to press ahead with its licensing plans. More news in the next issue of Ergon Shooter. Northern Ireland is changing its own legislation to deregulate the lower age limit at which a person may use a shotgun or air gun. The minimum age now drops to 12, having previously been 16, though shooting organisations have said it should be dropped as low as 10. Now young shooters will be able to participate in the sport, provided they're in a controlled environment such as a gun club and supervised by an adult with at least three years shooting experience. Scottish members of Parliament have discussed whether deer numbers north of the border need to be more tightly controlled. Hollywood's Rural Affairs Committee heard that deer numbers are the country's most pressing conservation issue. Environmental group Scottish Environment Links said red deer populations had nearly tripled since the 60s, but the ADMG disputed the claim, saying the population had declined in many areas. More deer news in Sporting Rifle magazine. The new, simpler licence application forms will come into effect on the 1st of December. A single form will cover grants and renewals for both shotgun and firearms licences, with a short separate form for variations to firearms certificates. Restrictions have also been removed on how much metallic ammunition shooters can buy at one time. Basque and the Countryside Alliance have both praised the new forms. And finally, shooting organisations have rejected a minister's suggestion that there will be no vote on the Hunting Act. Environment Minister George Eustace said there was a reluctance to vote on repeal as the outcome was not certain and parliamentary time was increasingly precious. But the Countryside Alliance said it was confident there was majority support for repeal. The Alliance's Tim Bonner said the Act was rapidly becoming a matter of trust between Cameron and the Countryside. That was the Shooting Show News. 
There's still time to add one more species to Byron's African wish list. He joins PH Harry on the trail of Jackal using the guide's high tech high seat. Well, this is a homemade chair. What I basically did is uh, you've got a, it's all hub of a vehicle. Drill the hole through, get with a tapered bearing to get power on, so now I can spin without having cords wound up or anything like that. Uh, it's obviously a, a very secure fitting as well. The rifle's actually clamped in. Clamped in. You get a few you can make a few adjustments on this. You can set it to the length of your stock and you can set the tilt the way it tilts, the stiffness and so on. I've normally got a driver. You use the hand light just for searching. Your rifle's clamped in like this just for more security when you're bumping around during vehicles. And then searching with a hand light and then you stop. You've got this one on your rifle, so there's no one actually manning the light for you. And you've got your dimmer as well, which you use a light, it dims it, and you use a light on your own. Some people swear by using red light, red filters. Uh, my personal experience with a, red, with a filter was further than about 200 yards, I can't make out what the animal is, so you can't see. And you can't, if you can't see, you can't shoot. You dim it, it doesn't, as a, as far as possible and you dim it down to where you can only pick up the eyes mm -hmm. and it doesn't bother the animal and as it comes in you slowly push it, push the dimmer up until you can have a clear shot and for identification purposes as well you can put on a bright light for up to 350 meters 400 meters you can actually make out if it's a jackal or just a diker inquisitive coming in or something like that. Your whole vehicle is covered in what is essentially hessian lining stitched together why do you go to that trouble? Well, on white vehicles, it sticks out like a little pimple at night, if you, you'll see tonight. Mm -hmm. And it just covers just a little bit of camo. If you've got a darker colored vehicle, like red, blue, gray, as such, you don't even have to put up a, put on a cover. It's just for, when the moon's out as well, it just lights up the white. So it's just a cover. With Harry in the hot seat, they head out to the first calling area where they play a number of distress calls, but sadly, to no avail. Initial lamping proves fruitless too, so they move towards an internal stock fence and set out their caller. Just wait for two, three minutes, just for to calm down and everything. This time their luck turns. Before long the lamp picks up eye shine and the boys can easily identify it as a jackal. The game is well and truly on. Harry scans the scrubby ground knowing the long grass won't make things easy. All his knowledge and sharp shooting skills will be called upon for sure. Scanning slowly and switching to a closer range call, Harry's patient approach pairs off. The muted distress call prompts an immediate response. With the quarry less than 60 yards away, he gets into position for the all-important shot. The shot is delivered effectively, but off-camera. No matter for Harry, it's a clean kill and a jackal in the bag. We set off to inspect and retrieve the carcass. When there's two coming in, the butcher's is normally the lead one running in front. You can see here's the entry. And if you look at the teeth, 
And she's lost you. She's about. You see the one there? They won her, but she's about two to three years old, this one. Normally, they'll go straight. But because she backtracked, she came downwind. Trying to catch our wind. From downwind, yeah, trying to catch our wind. Which didn't give us a big space to shoot or a lot of time to shoot. So we had to, before she gets away, we had yeah. to take her. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. This is The Shooting Show.